The circle is cast, the candles lit, the spell is spoken, and Mother Moon is watching all that we say and do. For the next short passage of time, you are in an enchanted place called the Witching Hour. Hi, it's Bill and Elle, and we are back once again. We're a little late, but we have a lot of things going on. So um, what I wanted to um, share with you today is an article by Pam Grossman from her forthcoming book, Waking the Witch, Reflections on Women, Magic, and Power. And this is what she had to say. And please remember, I'm reading Miss Grossman's words, not mine. But it's really funny because the way she, she set this up really reflects how I feel uh, probably 90... 94 to 99 percent of how she feels about this. I just thought it was interesting. So here we go. Yes, witches are real, I know, because I am one. Witches have always walked among us, populating societies and storyscapes across the globe for thousands of years, from Circe to Hermione, and from Morgan Le Fay to Marie Laveau. The witch has long existed in the tales we tell about ladies with strange powers that can harm or heal. And although people of all genders have been considered witches, it is a world that is now usually associated with women. Throughout most of history, she has been someone to fear, an uncanny other who threatens our safety and manipulates reality for her own mercurial purposes. She's a pariah, a persona non grata, a bogeywoman, to defeat and discard. Though she has often been deemed a destructive entity, in actuality, a witchy woman has historically been far more susceptible to attack than an inflictor of violence itself. As with other terrifying outsiders, she occupies a paradoxical role in cultural consciousness as both vicious aggressor and vulnerable prey. Over the past 150 years or so, the witch has done another magic trick by turning from a fright into a figure of inspiration. She is now as likely to be the heroine of your favorite TV show as she is its villain. She might show up in the form of your pagan co-worker, or the beloved musician who gives off a sorceress vibe in videos or on stage. There is also a chance that she is you in that which is an identity you have taken upon yourself for any number of reasons, or felt or flippant, public or private. Today, women are more than ever choosing the way of the witch, whether literally or symbolically. They're floating down catwalks and sidewalks in gauzy black clothing and adorning themselves with pentaurus-worthy pentagrams and crystals. They're filling up movie theaters to watch witchy films and gathering in back rooms and backyards to do rituals, consult tarot cards, and set life-altering intentions. They're marching in the streets with Hex the Patriarchy placards and casting spells each month to try to constrain the <clears throat> commander-in-chief, period. Year after year, articles keep proclaiming it's the season of the witch as journalists try to wrap their heads around the mushrooming witch trend. And all of this begs the question, why? Why do witches matter? Why are they seemingly everywhere right now? What exactly are they? And why the hell don't they go away? I get asked such things over and over, and you would think that after a lifetime of studying and writing about witches, as well as hosting a witch-themed podcast and being a practitioner of witchcraft myself, my answers would be succinct. In fact, I find the more I work with the witch, the more complex she becomes. Hers is a slippery spirit. Try to pin her down and she'll only receive 
further into the deep, dark wood. I do know this for sure. Show me your witches, and I'll show you your feelings about women. The fact that the resurgence of feminism and the popularity of the witch are ascending, at the same time, this is no coincidence. The two are reflections of each other. That said, this current witch wave is nothing new. I was a teen in the 1990s, the decade that brought us such pop culture as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Charmed, and The Craft, not to mention Riot Girls and third wave feminists who taught me that female power could come in a variety of colors and sexualities. I learned that women could lead a revolution while wearing lipstick and combat boots, sometimes even a cloak. But my own witchy awakening came at an even earlier age. Morganville, New Jersey, where I was raised, was a solidly suburban town, but it retained enough natural features back then to still feel a little bit scruffy in spots. We had a small patch of wood that abutted a horse farm, and the two were separated by a wisp of running water that we could cross via a plank of wood. In one corner of the yard, a giant puddle would form whenever it rained, surrounded by a border of ferns. My older sister Emily and I called this spot our magical place. That it would vanish and then only reappear only added to its mystery. It was a portal to the unknown. These woods are where I first remember doing magic, entering the state of deep play where imaginative action becomes reality. I would spend hours out there creating rituals with rocks and sticks, drawing secret symbols in the dirt, losing all track of time. It was a space that felt holy and wild, yet still strangely safe. As we age, we are supposed to stop filling our heads with such nonsense. We lose our tooth fairies and walk away from our wizards and dragons get slain on the altar of youth. Most kids grow out of their magical phase. I grew further into mine. My grandma, Trudy, was a librarian at the West Long Branch Library, which meant I got to spend many an afternoon lurking between the 001.9 and the 135 Dewey Decimal sections, reading about Bigfoot and the dream interpretation of Nostradamus, I spent countless hours in my room learning about witches and goddesses, and I loved anything by authors like George MacDonald, Raoul Dahl, and Michael Ende. Okay, Bill, could you help me out with this? Um, just, so, just for our listeners uh, about these particular authors in case they'd like to look them up. Just a quick background. George MacDonald was a Scottish author, pioneering in fantasy writing. He worked with Lewis Carroll and is best known for one of his fantasy books, The Princess and the Goblin. Roald Dahl, who was a Brit, wrote James the Giant Peach and Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Need I say more? <laughs> Michael Ende, a German, wrote fantasy and children's fiction, and his claim to fame among all the modern-day people would be the never-ending story. Thank you. And uh, just for another note, George, George MacDonald, the Scottish uh, writer, was also a Christian minister. Think about that for a while, okay? These writers were fluent in the language of enchantment. Books were my broomstick. They allowed me to fly to other realms and where anything was possible. Though fictional witches were my first guides, I soon discovered that magic was something real people could do. Yeah. I started frequenting New Age shops and experimenting with mass market paperback spell books from them all. I was raised Jewish, but found myself attracted to belief systems that felt more individualized and mystical and that fully honored feminine. Eventually, I found my way into modern paganism, a self directed spiritual path that sustains me to this day. I'm not unique in this trajectory of pivoting away from organized religion and towards something more personal. As of September 2017, 
more than a quarter of U.S. adults, and that's 27%, now say they think of themselves as spiritual but not religious, according to the Pew Research Center. Now I identify both as a witch and with the example of the witch overall, and I use the term fluidly. At any given time, I might use the word witch to signify my spiritual beliefs, my supernatural interests, or my role as an unapologetically complex, dynamic female in a world that prefers its women to be smiling and still. I use it with equal parts sincerity and salt, with a bow to a rich and often painful history of worldwide witch, witchcraft, and a wink to the other members of our not-so-secret society of people who fight with the fringes for the liberty to be at our weirdest and most wondrous selves. Magic is made in the margins. To be clear, you don't have to practice witchcraft or any other alternative form of spirituality to awaken your own inner witch. You may feel attracted to her symbolism, her style, or her stories, but are not about to rush out and buy a cauldron or go sing songs to the sky. Maybe you're more of a nasty woman, a devotee of the goddess. That's perfectly fine. The witch belongs to you, too. I remain more convinced than ever that the concept of witch endures because she transcends literalism and because she has so many dark and sparkling things to teach us. Many people get fixated on the truth of the witch, and numerous fine history books attempt to tackle the topic from the angle of so-called factuality. Did people actually believe in magic? They most certainly did, and they still do. Were the thousands of victims killed in the 16th and 17th century witch hunts actually witches? Most likely not. Are witches real? Why, yes, you're reading the words of one. All of these things are true. But whether or not they were actually women and men who practiced witchcraft in Rome or Lancashire or Salem, is less interesting to me than the fact that the idea of witches has remained so evocative and influential and so, well, bewitching in the first place. In other words, the fact and the fiction of the witch is inextricably linked. Each informs the other and always has. I am fascinated by how one example of a witch can encompass so many different facets. The witch is a notorious shapeshifter, and she comes in many guises. She's a hag in a pointy hat, cackling madly as she boils pots of bones, a scarlet-lipped seductress sipping a potion into the drink of her unsuspecting paramour a cross-dressing French revolutionary who hears the voices of angels and saints, a perfectly quaffed suburban housewife, twitching her nose to change her circumstances at will, despite her husband's protests, a woman dancing in New York City's Central Park with her coven to mark the change of the seasons or a new lunar phase. The witch has a green face and a fleet of flying monkeys, she wears scarves and leather and lace. She lives in Africa, on the island of Inia, in a tower, in a chicken-leg hut in Peoria, Illinois. She lurks in the forest of fairy tales, in the gilded frames of paintings, in the plot lines of sitcoms, and in young adult novels, and between the bars of ghostly blues songs. She is solitary. She comes in threes. She's the member of a coven. Sometimes she's a he. She is stunning. She is hideous. She is insidious. She is ubiquitous. She is our downfall. She is our deliverance. 
Our witches say as much about us as they do about anything else, for better or for worse. More than anything, though, the witch is a shining and shadowy symbol of female power and a force for subverting the status quo. No matter what form she takes, she remains an electric source of magical agitation that we can plug into whenever we need a high voltage charge. She is also a vessel that contains our conflicting feelings about female power, our fear of it, our desire for it, and our hope that it can and will grow stronger, despite the flames that are thrown at it. Whether the witch is depicted as villainous or valorous, she is always a figure of freedom, both its loss and its gain. She is perhaps the only female example who is an independent operator. Virgins, whores, daughters, mothers, wives, each of these is defined by whom she is sleeping with or not, the care that she is given or that is given to her, or some sort of symbiotic debt that she must eventually pay. The witch owes nothing. That is what makes her dangerous, and that is what makes her divine. Witches have power in their own terms. They have agency. They create. They praise. They commune with the spiritual realm freely and free of any mediator. They transform and they make things happen. They are change agents whose primary purpose is to transform the world as it is into the world they would like it to be. This also is why being called a witch and calling oneself as a witch are usually two vastly different experiences. In the first place, it's often an act of degradation, an attack against a perceived threat. The second is an act of reclamation, an expression of autonomy and pride. Both of these aspects of the witch are important to keep in mind. They may seem like contradiction, but there is much to glean from their interplay. The witch is an ultimate feminist icon because she is a fully rounded symbol of female oppression and liberation. She shows us how to tap into our own might and magic, despite the many who try to strip us of our power. We need her now more than ever. I hope you enjoyed that. I think Ms. Uh, Grossman is just absolutely, <clears throat> she's nailed this, and I hope you will, um, if you uh, get a chance to pick up her book, Waking the Witch, Reflections of Women, Magic, and Power. It's published by Gallery Books and uh, imprint uh, from Simon & Schuster. Thank you very much for listening. And now, my sweetie pie honey has some really interesting things, uh, words to talk to you about, about tarot. Hi. Today's section on tarot is kind of a back in time not the history, but starting from the basics. So far in our studies together, I've done individual cards. I've done history. Well, let's do some beginning things that even those of us who are familiar with Taro tend to forget. I'm taking a lot of this from an article written by Bridget Esselmont, who is the author of the number one Amazon best-selling books, The Ultimate Guide to Tarot Card Meanings, and The Biddy Tarot Planner, and the brand new book and tarot card deck, everyday tarot. We're, we're starting it with the title of How to Read Tarot Cards for Beginners. If you're just starting to learn how to read tarot cards, it might seem like there's so much to absorb, let alone the pressure to get every reading right. You can drive yourself nuts trying to learn all the spreads, study the multiple guidebooks, and learn the right meaning of each of the 78 cards in your deck. And to make matters worse, your guidebooks probably have different and sometimes contradictory card interpretations. There's a whole bunch of reading techniques and you're getting bogged down in complex esoteric systems and language that's more than a little out there. And can someone please show me how to make sense of the Tower card and the Ace of Wands already? I get it. I used to feel like that too, especially the getting it right part. But learning tarot doesn't have to be hard, doesn't have to be complicated or stressful. If you're just starting to learn tarot, we got you. 
Here are some tips on how to read tarot cards for beginners. First thing, choose a tarot deck. I know it would be easy to just say, go and get the Rider Waite deck, be done with it. Half of me almost feels that way. But I also want to honor and acknowledge that we all have different styles. Different tarot decks are going to resonate with us in different ways. And it's really important to connect with that and find a deck that is right for you. Just know that there's no perfect answer here. And ultimately, you do need to find a deck that feels good for you. However, no matter what decks you like to collect, the ones you use for your serious readings, try and avoid the cutesy ones. Your, uh, your friend or compatriot was sitting down with you to have a serious tarot reading is not going to be too affected by looking at Hello Kitty on the table. <laughs> Keep that one for your collection. That said, look for a good learning deck. If this is your first tarot deck, you want to make sure it's a deck that you can learn with and it's going to make your learning process easy and enjoyable. Think about things like the pictures. Look at the imagery on the card, that you can understand it quite quickly, as well as once you start to go deeper with learning about the tarot, then you can go much, much further with your studies. Choose a deck that you do resonate with visually, energetically, and make sure that you have that opportunity to go through the cards and check in how you're resonating with the deck. Secondly, familiarize yourself with the cards. Introduce yourself. Say, hello cards. Well, not literally hello cards, but go through the deck one by one and spend some time with each card. Flip over the first card. Gaze at the images on the card. What do you notice? What comes through to you? What do you see first? It might be a symbol. You might hear something. You might feel something in your body. You might start to see almost a story coming out through that particular card. Now you don't have to do anything with that information. This is just about connecting with each of your cards in the deck. Spend three or four minutes with each and just really drink it in. Take in the imagery, the energy of the card, and just become familiar. Then pick up another card. Do it all again until you've started to work your way all through the deck. Once you've accomplished that, thirdly you go do a daily tarot card reading. Now I don't personally do this. Aside from once in a while I'll pull a card out if I'm having a particular problem. But the best way to learn tarot and to create a personal connection with your cards is to draw one for yourself each day. Ask the tarot, what energy do I need to focus on today? And proactively, what energy do I need through the day? Or ask the tarot, what might I experience today? At the end of the day, match up what happened through your day and what you know the tarot card you drew. Over time, your bank of personal experiences linked with the tarot will grow and grow. Next, do a three-card reading. Now, nearly every tarot beginner book includes the Celtic Cross Tarot Spread. It's a beautiful spread, but at ten cards, it's not a great place to start for the tarot beginner. Instead, use simple three-card spreads. You'll be pleasantly surprised about how much insight you can gain from even just three cards, especially when reading multiple people at an event. If you use ten-card readings every reading, you'll have a time constraint, you'll feel tired at the end of the day, and honestly, if you do all 12, 14, 15 of your readings in a 10-card manner, you'll be dead. <laughs> oh, me. To start, create a sacred space, whatever that means for you. Maybe you get out your crystals, turn on some soothing music, burn some incense, grab a brew, whatever. Then ask your question. Next, shuffle and lay out your cards. When you read the cards, pay attention to the images. What story are they telling you? Keep in mind that story might be different than the textbook meaning is. Really feel into that story and to get the best intuitive skills you can. Make sure you record your reading in your tarot journal and commit to one action to achieve your goals. Now normally, nor have I ever, really used a journal for tarot. However, I wish I had started it years ago and I'm thinking seriously about starting one now as I can see benefits in going over this article what it can do for you. And in just a few weeks, if you do these steps, you could be reading tarot more confidently. Now, how do I truly master the tarot card meanings? When I first started learning tarot more than 40 years ago, don't go figuring my age here, I kept trying to memorize the meanings of individual cards. Maybe you're trying to do that now. I did everything I could think of to get the meanings to stick in my head. I tried writing out the means. I tried flashcards. I tried quizzing myself when I looked at a card and then looked at my meanings book to see if I got it right. 
I was concerned about looking amateurish in front of the people I was reading. No matter what I tried, I just couldn't remember all the card meanings. I felt discouraged. I felt like a failure. I felt like a fraud. Until one day, I heard a voice saying in my head, Hey, Bill, let's try something different. Over the years, I started to create my own way of relating to and understanding the cards. I experimented with trusting my still small voice within as a guide. But most of all, I let go of trying to memorize the cards and I focused on finding techniques that freed me to interpret them using my unique inner wisdom. And it doesn't make you look silly to use the guidebook. Most people actually appreciate the accuracy you give them by checking on exact meanings and even showing them. Okay, I've given you some steps to start with, or, as the case may be, a refresher for those of us who have been reading for a while. So, there you go. Good luck, enjoy your readings, and have a good time with it. Don't feel pressure. Now is the time to blow out the candles, pack our herbs, close our book of spells, and fold our tents. But before I go, we'd really like to hear from you. We'd like to know what you'd like to hear from us on the show and how often. We'd also like to hear from you if you are involved in the pagan community and have something you'd like to share with the listening audience. It's even possible that you could come and do a guest shot on The Witching Hour. Contact us through the website, thewitchinghour.com. I also have to thank the team of magicians who help put this show together every time we do one. Rob Steele, Lee Vowell, and the Happy Hour Network for hosting this program. There are links to both their pages on our page, thewitchinghour.com. And until we meet again, stay magical. Stay magical.